most distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Honest. Our world has changed radically, and it appears as if it has changed for the worse. Many now work from home. The world economy and the economy of each country has contracted sharply. Some economies will contract as sharply as minus 9%. Commodity prices have dropped significantly. There was a time in April when our premium crude oil was selling at $10 or less. Supply chains have been drastically disrupted. Some industries have literally shut down. Travel, tourism, entertainment, office real estate, and massive supply chain disruptions. Our earnings from oil and non-oil have dropped and will stay down for the significant future, as long as we can see. And our borrowings have gone up. Experts project that if we are lucky, our economy in Nigeria will contract by at least 5% in 2020, and it will not return to January 2020 levels till about Q2 2022, if we take the right policy decisions, that is. Our social infrastructure has been stretched to its limits and has been found wanting. Our social support has also been found inadequate. Countries, including ours, have responded to the coronavirus by shutting down the economy for certain periods. And this has gravely even further contracted economies. We have now entered the age of the next normal. In all of this, and despite the gloom, there are bright sparks. And we honestly have an opportunity to rebuild, to rebuild our country. We now know we must focus on our health and social infrastructure and bring them up to the highest standards possible. We know we have to be much more responsible leaders and citizens and be our brothers keepers. We now know more than ever that family, friends and colleagues matter most. We now know that we can and must work productively and more efficiently. We must fully embrace digitalization and technology. We now know that the public and private sectors in Nigeria can and must work well together to build a first world Nigerian economy, socially responsible, where no one is left behind and no man or woman is oppressed. An economy anchored on solid foundations of focused investments, integrity, strong values, rule of law, and social justice. Character characteristically, the Nigerian Bar Association, the Section on Business Law, has again provided a platform for us to discuss the next normal and provide policy and implementation choices. The theme of our conference this year, Business Unusual, Digital Acceleration for Growth in a New World, is so apt. And our session topic for this first plenary session is disrupting the status quo, charting the path for an alliance. An alliance that will frog leap Nigeria into the realms of first world countries. Today, we have a star-studded panel to discuss this issue and to set the tone for this year's SBL conference. It is my distinct honor it is a privilege to introduce to you this morning our panelists, four accomplished professionals and business people. The Honorable Minister for Mines and Steel Development of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, my brother, a renowned architect and a man of many parts, nine-year or eight-year commissioner in Ogun State. I think that's a Guinness Book of Record issue. A man of exemplary character, a go-getter and a performer. And I expect us to see dramatic and remarkable things from his ministry. He's a man with immense academic accomplishments. And there are many edifices all over Nigeria that you can put against his name. Please join me in welcoming architect Olami Lekon Adegbite, fondly called Lekon by his friends, 
and Honorable Minister by the rest of us. Honorable Minister, good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you. The Honorable <laughs> Minister will not be with us through the session, mm. but we'll try and take out as much of his time as we can. He has to be in the villa for a meeting at about 10 to 12, but he'll be with us for as long as he can stretch it. Luckily, Abuja is not Lagos, so he can get to the villa as quickly as possible. Next is another remarkable professional, a woman of massive accomplishments, the chief executive of a company we know as Cadbury, Convita people, uh, an accounting guru, I'd like to call her. When you see her, you see accomplishment. She used to be finance director in many first-class multinationals, but today she has the distinct honor and privilege, and by God's grace, of being the managing director of Cadbury Nigeria PLC, and not just managing director of Cadbury Nigeria PLC, she's the managing director of Mundelez, that's the ownership company in the whole of West Africa. I salute you, Mrs. Oyeyimika Oye Adeboye, your immense academic accomplishments, a renowned chartered accountant, a boardroom guru. I thank you for joining us on this panel. Good morning, madam. Good morning, thank you Next very much. Is another favorite person of mine, a banker of no mean repute. You think she's young for her accomplishments, but she's inherited a tradition and pedigree of her accomplishments. Mrs. Ngova Ihembe Mwankwo, she's the head of coverage at Rand Merchant Bank Nigeria Limited, has been in banking for 20 years. She's an accomplished banker first focal point for majority of their institutional and corporate clientele at the Rand Merchant Bank. She has extensive academic accomplishments. She went to that famous university known as Durham University where she collected the degree PPE. And she has numerous masters and other professional degrees behind her name. She has been institutional and instrumental to Rand's market incursion in Nigeria since they came in here. She is today the chairperson of the Executive Council of Wimbers, Women in Management, Business and Public Service. Ngove, my sister, I welcome you. Last Thank but you. not the least is my, I kept him to the end because um, he's my professional colleague. But more importantly, when we all get into trouble, we have to look for him. Um, he is today the head of the Nigerian of the Sanctions Department and the Directorate of Legal Sanctions okay. at the Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit. If you can Google that unit, you will know that you need to know the person I'm introducing to you. He's a lawyer of over 20 years experience and a substantial part of his experience has been in lawmaking. He's been advisor to two Senate presidents. He's helped them formulate business related laws and he has worked extensively in these parts, both with the private sector and the public sector. He's worked with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. He's worked with the SBL, the Nigerian Bar Association. He has worked extensively with the executive. And he's somebody that knows about lawmaking, what to do for lawmaking, and the laws that we require in this country to turn us around the curve. Please join me in welcoming my brother, Mr. Kingsley Amaku. Good morning, Kingsley, and welcome. I'll go straight to our questions. Um, and Honorable Minister, because I know you are running tight for time, I'll start with you, sir. And I'll ask you the very first question this morning. Sir, the world has changed dramatically in the last six months. The world has been totally disrupted. Um, this pesky virus has come to change our whole lives. So considering the negative impacts of COVID-19 and the economic and social consequences, do you think as a country we have been put in place appropriate economic policies to weather this raging storm and its consequences? If you think so, or if you don't think so, what more do you think we should do to climb out of the depressive consequences of this disruption? Uh, you'll be speaking, sir, as the Honorable Minister, as a representative of this government and as yourself. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Asare. And uh, thank you for your generosity in the, in the introduction. Uh, well, I think um, COVID-19 pandemic uh, has brought to the fore 
some of the underlying problems that we had and which we are now first to confront. And I think government is trying its best uh, to, of course, to put in policies to cushion this effect and possibly uh, prevent us from going to uh, a depression. Uh, the recession, we may not be able to avoid that, but at least we don't go into depression. Um, government has set out certain things. The first thing is we need to, government being the biggest spender in the economy, we need to put out a lot of money there through certain programs to cushion that effect. Towards that, the council, I think at its, its meeting two weeks ago, approved that government should spend 2.3 trillion Naira uh, in the economy in the next one year. Uh, that's extra budgetary through various sectors. Uh, agriculture being uh, the most important one. Uh, public housing, which of course would generate a lot of employment. Uh, my sector, which is uh, mines and cell development. And of course, uh, various other sectors. Oh, oh so I, I forgot power as well. Power is getting a large chunk of that money as well. Uh, I'll probably touch about the details of that. That's an immediate measure. Government came up with this idea of employing 1,000 people per local government. We have uh, 774 local governments uh, in Nigeria. That will give us uh, 774,000 employment uh, in various fields. Um, skilled and unskilled as well, a good mix. This, of course, will put money in, in people's pockets uh, almost immediately. We're also working on import substitution. That is, a, a, a lot of materials, raw materials that are used by industries, uh, which, of course, we can find uh, locally. Either though we've had to ship out these raw materials and they come back to us uh, as finished product for our industry or semi-finished products. Uh, that's another policy. Also, we're looking at, this had started uh, prior the, uh, to COVID, thank God for that, is to be able to feed ourselves. Uh, eat what we grow and grow what we eat. That's the policy, uh, that's the uh, feed ourselves. And of course, uh, last but not the least, is the support for businesses uh, with the CBN is spearheading. The first of this is, that banks should ease the payment of uh, interest for businesses until March next year. That is, uh, uh, give some moratorium during that period. At the same time, uh, CBN is offering funds at very generous rates uh, to businesses, small businesses, even big businesses, so they can bring down uh, their cost. Uh, those are the five things that I think the government is uh, those five items that government is using uh, to make sure that the pandemic, the effects of the pandemic on the economy is moderated. Uh, uh, just uh, if I still have some time, I can uh, go deeper into some of them. Uh, part of the government spending, the 2.3 trillion naira, we, under power, the idea is to power all these off-grid local areas through solar. And the idea is to import the solar panels in knockdown parts so that the assemblage is there. It will lead to training and provide employment for a lot of people because we're going to do this all over the country. Uh, I think about uh, almost 500 uh, billion is voted into this. We're going to put uh, give power to all these off-grid areas using the youths of this country to assemble the panels to, to do the installation and of course uh, the wiring uh, in those local areas. That's true uh, power. Agri is going to be employing a lot of people. Uh, I think these have started already. Uh, you offer one hectare uh, in your local area, one hectare of land, that's about 10,000 square meters, for you to grow whatever you want to grow. And uh, government will fund you on this, provide all the inputs, uh, machineries, and all that. And I think that's also taking a large chunk of the 2.3 trillion. On public housing, this is to build houses massively all over the country. It will solve the problem of housing at the same time, also create employment. And the trust in this time is not to use the big names. You don't find something like Kappa 
and Abatu or GK for there. It's going to be young engineers, young engineering graduates to form the, to come together with architects, country surveyor, all these young professionals who don't have anything to do, to come together, form teams. And, you know, you could be saddled with, okay, go and build 10 houses, go and build 20 houses and all that. So these are the ways that the money is going to be pushed out. For my sector. I'm going mining, to come to you. I have a special question for you and your sector, Honorable Minister. And okay. You really set the tone. Thank because you. Because I now see the mind of government. And that's why we're speaking this morning. The mind of government is talking about what government will do. Government is biggest spender, the regulator. Government will guide us. I think that's the mind shift that this session is about. That is not about government. Because we now know today that government doesn't have all the resources to do the things it genuinely wishes to do. So we now need to shift government's mind towards government and the private sector. And I'm going to come back to you before you go, sir. So I want you to start thinking about that. How are we going to shift your mind in government away from government doing everything? particularly with the experiences of the last six months. So I'm going to come back to the point. But before I come back, let me run very quickly to Yumika. Thank you so much. Yumika, note what the minister has been talking about. Government, the biggest spender. Government do this. CBN do that. Okay? Is that how we're going to progress? And let me ask you, how is the private sector, particularly your business area, but speaking for the private sector with your varied experience and listening to the other minister thinking that government should do everything, how are we now going to cope with this army disruptions of the last six months? Can the private sector do it by itself or does it want to do it by itself? What are the policy choices you think we should make to ensure we survive? And then very relatively quickly return to a growth trajectory. What, what, what's your thinking? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me um, at this session. Um, first of all, I, I don't think government can do everything and we, we need to face reality. Um, I would just take our initial experience in the first three, four months of the lockdown. And it was very clear that one of the key success factors of that period was just the partnership between government and the private sector. Um, I recall very well the Lagos State Governor um, calling uh, key companies into meetings. We've had about three meetings with him, just going through you know, ways of working. What do we need to do? Where do we, where do we need his support? That is recognizing that government cannot do everything. Um, one of the key things I would say in terms of policy changes, you, you talked about policy changes. Um, it's clear to us that our health sector has a massive gap to fill. Um, and just looking at that alone, if somebody had said to us what a year ago that we would be facing what we're facing today, we might have said, or oh, whoever said it was smoking something very cheap, it, didn't, it wouldn't have made sense. Today, we're facing uh, a totally different um, dimension in all our lives and our businesses. And we all have to change how we do business. We all know that technology has helped significantly. We're on this conference today uh, using technology. And I think that's one place that government needs to invest in. I, I find it very strange. Um, we have schools having closed. A lot of the government schools could not carry on online schooling. Um, a lot of private schools and international schools carried on private uh, schooling, but we couldn't do it here in Nigeria. Significantly, a lot of children were sitting at home doing absolutely nothing with parents who had to find a way to, 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 to keep them going. I think one of the things that government would need to do in, in, in serious partnership with the private sector is invest more in technology. Most people have telephones now. So we're one step in the right direction. How can we use that and technology to, 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 to work better and to change the law of our, of our country? I know we're going to talk about a lot of things later on, but I think this is one of the things that we need to focus on. And the second thing is one reality that I think everybody must accept, whether we like it or not, is that this uh, pandemic is not going to disappear in a month's time. Let's just assume we're going to have to live with this for another year or two. I know a lot of people are saying, God forbid. But, you know, let's just assume that. And I think that's the way we should begin to think and shape whatever we want to do around to the fact that, you know, these things will be here for a long time. And one or two years, a long time, as we've seen in the last six months. And let's begin to look at one, how do we help people to operate in the new, in the new model? A lot of companies are used to people coming to work. Everybody must come to work. Employers want to see people. They don't understand that people can work remotely. Now we've been forced to understand it and to accept it. You know, so you know, put, put policies in place that would enable um, employees to work from home if they don't need to be physically in the office. Obviously, for us, for example, we're manufacturers. We have people physically producing in the factories. We're selling. We have people selling on the field. 
But again, we, we've also had, had to adopt to things like telesales. You know, we've had to adopt to neighborhood stores. We've had to put in more vans so that, so that we have more you know, foot soldiers on the field, right? Because open markets were short. You know, 70% of our business is in open markets. You're carrying up those. You know, with the, short, with the open markets being short, I know now we have alternative days of markets opening with the East Down. But in the first three, four months, there were no open markets. And we still needed to get food to people. You know, how can we carry on operating going forward without having all these open markets? Because for, for another year or two, we would not be able to go and have this massive occurrence of the world to shop at, you know? So changing that norm, like I said, people have phones. How can people use their phones to shop? You know, door-to-door -door delivery. How do we make that um, easy for, for manufacturers and for, for commercial people to, to be able to go and sell to people without having to need brick and mortar? You know, we've seen in, the, in, in a lot of developed countries, um, that technology has helped significantly. I know uh, we're a global company. And when we look at China, it was the first place this happened at. And we've learned a lot from the Chinese uh, Chinese business because the China business did, did so many uh, things to just make sure that they carried on. Interestingly, they made more money um, as a food business during COVID than you know before COVID because they adapted to things quickly. And the, company, the economy and the company, the government adapted very quickly to those changes and made quick changes to operate. And that's what we need to look at in Nigeria, thank, in my view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimika. You know, I fully agree with you that um, COVID may be with us for quite a while. And a lot of your Fortune 500 colleagues have estimated and projected that we are going to be in a COVID scenario for the next few years. And nobody, they don't see, you know, the survey carried out on, uh, on, uh, on uh, Fortune 500 CEOs indicates that they don't see um, I was getting back to 2020 January levels in at least Q3 2022. So that's a tough one. And so we all need to readapt and technology appears to be the way. Honorable Minister, sir, let me come back to you very quickly because I see your protocol people are pulling you away. But let me come back to you very quickly. Um, again, the mindset, government, biggest spender. Um, the CBN governor is now in the center of everything we're doing. Um, are we not really overregulated? That's my first question. And secondly, how is government, like Mrs. Adeboye said, how is government now going to fully, fully collaborate with the private sector the way you, we did when the pandemic started, the COVID collaboration, the health infrastructure collaborations? How will government transfer this to collaboration in developmental issues and policy making? And thirdly, Mr. Minister, you know, three in one, we have talked about diversifying the mineral sector forever for youngs. We've been talking about it since I wore um, uh, Pampas or something. I don't know whether it was Pampas that time, you know, we've been talking about it forever. Now, sir, what are your own plans as the minister for actualizing this diversification? Now more than ever, it's critical we do so. We cannot depend on oil anymore and the yo-yo in of oil prices and the impact on our revenues. So what exactly will you do, sir, to make sure that during your term, we actually do diversify through the mineral sector? And how do you intend to achieve this collaborating with the private sector? Because you do not have the resources to do it by yourself. You must attract patient capital to come into the minister. Sorry that I'm loading you with... Uh, a quadruple barrel question, but I think uh, before I appreciate that. So I, I'll leave that. the most out of you. <laughs> yeah, before I, before I run off. Yeah, thank you. Um, government is aware of this, and I think maybe I didn't get to that point. Uh, this the this economic uh, recovery thing was led by the VP, and the main thrust of that was that you see, it must be private sector participation. Even this fund will not be spent by government alone. Uh, in each of the sectors, we're going to in, make sure in, embed private sector practitioners because they're going to be they're going to be uh, delivery milestones and all that with the private sector in, fully involved in this. But what's most important is that even the private sector has been impacted negatively by this COVID nineteen. So you find that even the private sector they're running to government for one sort of assistance or the other. Uh, I'm quite aware of uh, of some, and even the CBN is coming uh, to the rescue. One of those is, like I said, mandating banks to at least give a moratorium. So we are quite aware of this. 
and a, the, is the total technology. Now, that is what worries us, Honorable Minister. How is the CBN coming to the rescue, partnering with people like this is Adebo Yimika and Igobe? Uh, how are they partnering to come to the rescue? Which I think is the key. Yeah, it, 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 how are it, you it, in your ministry partnering to come to the rescue? Yes, that, I, I, I'm coming to that. You see, one of, one of the, because of technology, and we, 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 we keep mentioning, yeah, people have phones, but don't forget that a lot of people are off-grid areas. They don't have power. And if you if we go ahead, the way we've been doing in the past, like I said, some of the underlying problems are coming to the fore. We need to be, make this inclusive. That is why government is planning to spend so much money with the private sector, of course, involvement of the private sector, on power, solar power for the whole grid areas. Because if you keep growing that way, you're going to leave those guys behind. They won't be part of your shopping online and all that. People don't have power. But they, they can get phones easily. And with the solar power, they can charge their phones. You can also give them internet, which is all part of this program. And that's where government is coming in with the private sector. Take power to them give them uh, the internet. And of course, with a little phone, they can be part of this growth or the new normal. Otherwise, they're going to be left behind, which has been the problem in the past. Our growth has not been all inclusive. And this we're doing with the private sector so that everybody is carried along and the growth uh, benefits everybody. Uh, I'll quickly go uh, to those strategies uh, because it dovetails into this with, with the involvement of the private sector. The strategy using my sector to get the economy back on track, and uh, I'll go through uh, five things uh, basically that we're doing. The first one is the NIMEP uh, project. This is acquisition of data, geotechnical data, to attract the right investors into that sector. Number two is the artisanal and small scale sector, which of course dominates uh, mining in Nigeria now. The, uh, all, all the uh, assistance we're giving to them. Number three, I'll say it's Agile Kucha Steel Company. Uh, that's a major for us because the game changer, it, it, it will finish that. And then the gold uh, economy itself, we are creating a, a, a gold ecosystem in Nigeria. Uh, it's called Pagmi. In fact, that's the meeting I'll be going for uh, when I leave here at the, at the villa. We are presenting the first gold bar LBMA go back to the president today, and uh, it, it will be uh, on the news later in the day. And of course, number five is the downstream policy beneficiation, which we did not have before. We, which, of course, when I came into office, uh, I, I will start developing that. The first one, nine what's about it? It's all about de risking the sector. We've not had major miners or these juniors coming to Nigeria because it's highly risky. So for us to de-risk the sector, we need to provide the data that tells you to a certain extent that, look, you've got this mineral here, whether you're looking for gold or it's lead zinc or it's columbite, whatever you're looking for. So that's, government has put about $50 million into this. Of course, in co a collaboration with the private sector, the people actually leading uh, the exploration itself are private sector-based people. These are what they call competent person. And we're trying to get that data. We're also spending so much money. I'm trying to do this once more. Uh, the artisanal miners, they are about 80 to 85% of the miners in Nigeria today. Government has put outside a fund for them to organize them better, to teach them safer methods. Everybody probably remember the lead poisoning sample that killed several uh, young people. This is part of ignorance. When you use what you, eat, what you are eating to pound uh, uh, lead uh, with gold, of course, uh, ingesting gold. Government is putting a lot of money in this supply them with equipment, give them funds at very cheap rates. The Ajakuta itself, I, I'm, I'm sure we're all aware that sometime in October last year, uh, during the bilateral with the Russians, President Buhari got the uh, approval and the Russians are going to come into resuscitate the Ajakuta. They did it as USR in the past, but now they're coming back as Russians to fix Ajakuta for us. We've got pledges, $1.1 billion from African Bank and the Russian Export Center, $450 million. This is more than enough to fix the plant itself. And then the, if Ajakuta should come on stream, it's got a lot of potential upstream and downstream uh, for our metallurgists and all that. Uh, uh, Pagmi, this is the Presidential Artisanal uh, Gold Mining Initiative, which of course has resulted in what we are doing today. The gold 
that these people find in small small nuggets are smuggled out of Nigeria to Dubai. In Dubai, normally when you take gold to any country, they should ask for the certificate. But there's a slight exception in UAE. They don't ask questions, they just take your gold. Nigeria has been losing so much money, government does not benefit anything from it. So government has started a process that we, we've now created buying centers locally, and we are even buying at better rates than the smugglers. So now artisanal miners bring the gold to us, they sell to government, I mean, government are created buying centers. Government doesn't really own these centers. They give license to individuals, to private sector. So they bring the gold to this and we aggregate. This is the bar we are presenting today to the president. From that, we go on refining. We've licensed two refineries in Nigeria. That's Dukia Gold and Ken Smith. They're about to take off. But this particular one was refined in Turkey and was returned. The good thing is that the CBN is the half taker of this gold. CBN cannot buy gold from us in Naira and be able to keep that as part of their foreign reserve in dollars. So this first, uh, we, we've got about three bars now. This bar is going to, is, of course, it's already in CBN's vault. They're going to pay for it in Naira and it will be recognized because it's FBMA certified as part of their uh, foreign reserve. And the last one, there are a lot of minerals that will mine in Nigeria, which we just export the raw haul. And of course, they come back to us as raw materials for industry, whether it's uh, like Cadbury, the paint companies, the pharmaceuticals. We've got Kaolin, uh, we, we've got Bayright for the oil industry. What we are doing, it was just to export this in the raw form. And they come back to Nigeria for, 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 the, for the industry. Now, with this downstream policy that we have in place, we are coming to a situation where to export raw oil will not be allowed anymore. A sort of ban on exporting raw. There must be some local beneficiation. And we are working with private sector in, uh, investors. We are creating the infrastructure. We are, give, we are putting powers in clusters. We are building roads for these clusters. We are inviting investors to come and put the beneficiation uh, equipment there. So you, you, whatever you mine, you can, of, of course, turn into raw materials for industries locally. And of course, the industries can uh, make use of, the, uh, of those things. Thank you very things. much, Honorable Minister. You know, thank you very yeah. much. And you've, you've covered a lot of ground. And I wish you could stay with us on, because I know there will be many questions for you. And many of the discussions by the other panelists will have to what you say. But we have certain, we have some message for you, Honorable Minister. Yes, you, you've given us this your five point plan, and I know there are others. But we're going to hold you to your five point plan because the work of your ministry is fundamental to Nigeria's development and growth. And it's going to help us drive out of this depression or recession, whichever way it goes. So, Honorable Minister, Ajaokuta is, is a must, and all of this is a must. But more importantly, can we please pass a message to the government through you, sir, that the private sector is ready, willing, and able to partner and support the government in achieving those things that will take us out of where we are and make us a first world economy. And please, sir, government should stop having this distrust of private capital. It is, it is holding us back. Government must not distrust private capital. They are responsible private capitalists in Nigeria, and government must focus with them. They're the Cadbury's of this world, the Rand's of this world, and there are many others, you know? So government must partner with responsible private sector operators. If government doesn't, we won't reach the goals we should reach. So that's our message for you. We wish you could be here with us longer, but thank you for your time. And then, thank you, in Gover, in Gover, thank you Honorable Minister. In Gover, let me come to you very, you've listened to the Honorable Minister, you've listened to Yemika, in, your industry is critical to what's going on in this country. And your industry is extremely critical to providing the facility and the basis for us to grow ourselves out of the problems we're in. A big part of our refrain in seeking to develop over the years has been the role of real, and that's real patient foreign direct investment, the kind of investment that brought Cadbury into this country. Oh. Now that Portfolio investment has dried up, that's clear. And we've seen the exit of portfolio investors. How do we now attract real development capital that stays? How do we attract true, genuine private sector partners? And in these times, can we truly attract them the way our own landscape, our policies, our laws are? Can we attract them? And, you know, secondly, what's the trend you're seeing in your own environment in RAND? What's the direction of capital flow? And what must we do in Nigeria if the direction of capital flow is outwards? What must we do 
to bring it inwards because we know that government cannot afford all the things it wants to do. That the only way Nigeria is gonna grow is private capital. Mm -hmm. And what do we need to do? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. There's a lot of questions. I will try to answer them all, but if I miss any out, please let me know. And thank you very much to the MBA section on business law for having me on the panel. I think the, the first thing I'd like to say is we, we typically see FDI and FPI as one is good and one is bad. Uh, I think both are equally important to the economy. They're very fundamental sources of capital. They play different roles, but they're both very important. And what we need to be mindful of is the balance. So very quickly, I'll just sort of explain what the differences in the two are, and then I'll you know, land on the FDI, which is the focus of the conversation today. So the FBI, the foreign portfolio investors, are those who are investing in equities or in securities. We typically refer to those investments as hot money. But the thing with those investments is they're pretty easy to get in. Um, and tenor-wise, they're short tenored But the, the truth is, given the right environment, given the right scenario, you can attract a lot of that coming in. And as a country, we do need to have some level of FBI coming in. Now, the FDIs, the foreign direct investment are referred to as the real investment because it typically is invested in a tangible form. That's the Cadbury-like the Cadbury -like investment, okay? So they're coming in and they're either buying a company or investing in a company, and in some way they are impacting the ecosystem in a bigger way than an FPI typically would. And... Um, so you get these investments coming in either, you know, horizontal, same businesses, or they're buying something that they're not, not already in, or conglomerate, where they're aggregating various different investments um, and coming into a country. And the benefits of that, obviously, is that you see job creation, you see transfer of technology and skills. And from a tenor perspective, they're long tenor. We know how long Cadbury has been with us here in Nigeria, and there are many other companies as well that have come in and established either Greenfield or Brownfield and have done very, very well. So the reality is when you look at the numbers of FDI and FBI into Nigeria, we have seen attrition in the numbers even prior to the current pandemic. So we first saw attrition in FDIs and in about 2018, 2019, we saw that balance between FDI and FPI really swing heavily into the FPI space where a lot of people were bringing money in for FPIs, but weren't seeing the FDI come in. Now, the sad part of that is we were able to exist on the FPI flows, but then once there was um, problems with, and it didn't start with the pandemic, it first started with a concern around emerging markets. And then that sort of started about the quarter four last year, and then it dovetailed into quarter one this year when we started hearing about China, we saw the slowdown in the economy starting, we saw oil prices come down, and then it fell off a cliff. So where we are at the moment is from both sides, both the FDIs and the FPIs, we, um, we, we've seen attrition, significant attrition. If anything, we're actually stepping into the negatives where more money is going out than money coming in. But there is some good news. And the good news is that from a regional perspective, Nigeria is one of the top three destinations for capital inflows. Um, and we're behind countries such as Egypt. Um, and to a certain extent, Ghana, there's an argument as to whether we are above or behind. But in truth, there, there are countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Nigeria, and Egypt are all competing for capital. And I think that's where, as a country, we need to focus on it. It was interesting to hear the Honorable Minister speak. And so to go to your question around, can we and should we be attracting foreign capital? Certainly we have to. We just don't have enough of that capital locally to do all the things we want to do. So we have to create an enabling environment for capital to come in. But for capital to come in, then it's not altruistic. People don't sit down and say, oh, you know, we feel sorry for Nigeria today, less than a couple of million dollars. There has to be a purpose to which that money is coming in. We have to be able to compete favorably against Egypt, against Ghana, against the BRICS countries even, to say, why would any investment committee conclude a decision and have Nigeria as the country it wants funds to go in? And so we need to be doing 
some interesting things. And, and, you know, first of all, we need open markets. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing Mr. Marcus speak because we need to create the right environment. Then there has to be transparency and there has to be an ease with which business is done. We also need to be looking at, we have an investment promotion council, which has done great work already on the ease of doing business. But I would argue that in, in addition to just, we can't only attract people. The work is threefold. You have to attract, and then you've got to also tell the policy makers internally what the enabling environment should look like for capital to come in. So there has to be a constant conversation between both sides of the equation. You know, you want to invest in Nigeria, what would you like to see optimally before you come in? And that has to be passed on to the right policy makers so that we create that environment. And we've got to think very carefully about the sectors. Um, I liked when Yumika talked about technology. I think my, my biggest concern, and when I looked at the question you sent me earlier, you, you said, you know, a clear development agenda. And that I think is what is missing. We need to have a clearly articulated and disseminated plan around what are the sectors as a country we want to focus on, we want to encourage flows into, and what sort of enabling environment do these investors want to see? Obviously, infrastructure is also very critical, and I, and I won't you know, speak too much around that. The other thing is security. So we sometimes, I think, underestimate the importance of just peace of mind and going to bed at night is, you know, why would I want to invest in a country where, you know, I'm not sure how my, my staff will get in or out, you know, will they be safe? Do they have access to, to, to good health care? Um, is my investment safe? You know, and if something does go wrong, do I have the right institutions that I can seek redress from? And that, of course, is where the NBA section on business law comes in. So there are a number of things I think we, we, we need to do. But I, I just wanted to, to leave with the point that we can invest and we can attract the right investments. We are a great country. We've got the great demographics, um, but we've got to think of it as a race. We've got to prepare for it. We've got to have a vision and a goal. And we have to be single-minded about making sure we're doing the right things to attract capital. I didn't want to put you on the line because uh, I, would have, I would have asked you point blank that uh, are we doing it and why are we not doing it? But I'll let you think about that for a few minutes huh? and not put you on the line. Let me go straight to Kingsley. Um, and Kingsley, let, let, me, let, me, let me ask you about the enabling environment. You know, um, you've been in a position where we've had to look at what we need to do to create. You know, Angova said we're in a race where we're racing with different people and different economies to attract the kind of capital that created the Cadbury's, the Unilever's, and all, uh, the Shell's, the mobiles of this world. People that have come here and have been here for 40 years, 50 years or more. Um, so let me ask you this question. Huh? And um, I know you wear two or three hats, but I'll ask you this particular one. And I also know that um, you used to be an advocate. In recent times, we haven't had a conversation, but you used to be an advocate of uh, strong collaboration between the private and public sector. But you know, sometimes when people have spent a bit of time in Abuja, their views change. So let me ask you, we, we talk about government creating an enabling environment for development. And that conversation is, is never complete without a discussion on appropriate regulation, appropriate policy. So over the years, we see bills like the Petroleum Industry Bill getting stuck in the legislature and many other such bills that could have um, leapfrogged and gingered our economy. What are the regulatory structures, policies and legal structures that are underway or that you think we need to put in place for a diversified economy, an economy that truly encourages the private sector? And what collaborations do you think are required to achieve this? You need to unmute, Kingsley. You're still muted. You're muted. Oh, OK. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, thank you very much. OK, OK, thank you very much. Um, First of all, I want to thank the uh, MBA SBL for having me. Um, we have been partners for a while, so the SBL is like a family. 
but on the question you pose, you see, the issue of collaborating with government has always been for us um, an ad hoc measure. And that is where the big problem lies. Unless we the issue of collaborating with government as a very import, important fundamental pillar to getting good governance or to getting those policies we need in place. We will not get those policies we need and we will not get the laws we need. Um, if we backtrack a little to 2015, 14, and uh, 16, when we all started this conversation, the product of the collaboration we had, the National Assembly had with the private sector, was monumental. It produced very clear paths for governments to intervene and create cheaper ways for SMEs to make get finances. The best and way forward to making agriculture a stable and growing uh, sector for the Nigerian economy. Because why did we get this? Because we, we were able to plug the gap that has always existed in governance, which is the knowledge gap. The assumption is always that government should make policies, government should make laws, but the private sector has to play the, the, the role of closing the gap through engagement in terms of the role of, has to close the gap in the knowledge gap through engagement. And the products we had, like the bills we were able to put together, which we then call the priority bills, of which you just mentioned one now. These bills, when we pass them, or some of them that are still um, in the making now, have to change the economy in very deep ways. Why is that possible? It is only possible because that gap was closed. But I understand that to, since 2019, last year, up until now, there hasn't been much engagement going on in terms of deliberately continuing to tweak this process and bring in on board the kind of laws that we need at the appropriate time and the policies we need. I give you a, an example. 2019 was big on one item, one huge investment item, and it was the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. It became big because for the first time, African countries found a way to galvanize themselves and work towards a, a, uh, a unified. But what has that meant for us as Nigerians? What has government done to improve the ability of Nigerian businesses to operate in this larger market? Um, it is very important to note that unless we take in the right collaboration with government today, none of it will happen. Government will not be able to do anything meaningful. So what can we do and what should be done? What I think that needs to be done is the same thing that happened before the advent of the Silicon Valley in the US. You know, when the conversation around uh, the success of the Silicon Valley um, is the popular conversation or, or people say is that it is the confluence of capital and education that brought in the internet revolution. But it wasn't. It was the critical collaboration and engagement between the private sector who saw the vision that was coming and engaged government, both 
the executive, the legislature, and the, and the judiciary in fashioning the best ways to change the American copyright system in such a dramatic manner that it gave the Silicon Valley a global advantage that even its um, competitors across the globe found it hard to catch up. So I say to SBL and I say to the private sector, it is time to stop asking government to do this and do that. It is time to put a thinking and direction towards a knowledge engagement with government in what I will call collaborative, innovative governance system, where this, the private sector doesn't sit back and say, government do this, government do that. But the private sector would put money into advocacy and pressure using the political tools that we have. It's, it's, there's no other way to say to government, okay, listen, now we don't have infrastructure. You don't have the money to provide that infrastructure, but we have the capital to help you. In the area of health, education, there are many policies and regulations that rather constrict private sector. but it requires strategic engagement with government. Kingsley, you, you, yes, you, you really got into very interesting waters here. And I'm going to yes, jump sir. to you, Yemeka, because as a business leader, as one of the leading business leaders, Kingsley seems to have what, uh, set us on what you call the high jump. Kingsley says that it's the, truly the business leaders now that must seek a way to collaborate with government and entice government to want to collaborate with you. That's what I think I'm hearing from him. How do we entice government to want to collaborate from us? You know? um, isn't it government really that you reach out to us? So what Kings is trying to say that we should be the ones reaching out to government, that we should be the ones reaching out to government. We should be the ones having that knowledge engagement and telling government that government, you don't have money, we'll give you money. Okay, so what's, what are your thoughts on this, Yimika? And if it is so, how do you think your sec you as a business leader with your colleagues should galvanize this process to get government to trust us and want to partner with us. Thank you. Um, I think first of all, this is interesting to, to expect the private sector um, to, to call government to do, to, to do various things. I agree, first of all, I said earlier on that you have to have public private sector um, um, collaboration, that's very important. It's, that's what's happened all over the world. But I'm not sure that uh, the private sector and uh, individuals who, who went and uh, voted for government, uh, various um, individuals voted to then have to spend their uh, time and resources reminding government of what it needs to do. Um, I believe at the end of the day, with, with, with what's going on, and I'd like us to focus on, on more what needs to be done. With what is going on and what needs to be done, the collaboration is important. In reality, it really doesn't matter who pushes who. Typically, it's best for government to do it. Uh, but there are various um, uh, interest groups that would also do that. I mean, we are members of NECA and MAN, for example. And we are pushing quite a lot of things through those bodies in government. And you see in media uh, how very active NECA, NECA is and how very active MAN is on our behalf. So, you know, through that forum, we, would, we can do things and we are doing things. But I think, you know, when you look at the bigger picture, you know, the government needs to lead the process. Um, yes, we are not expecting government to have all the financing. And, you know, you will see people from big multinationals and um, enterprises like Dangote ourselves. We have a lot of initiatives that we do that, you know, in some countries, government does. We have sustainability initiatives, you know, helping farmers. We have a lot of uh, uh, backward integration happening. Ourselves and various multinationals are doing that just to, you know, to, to, to revive the economy and to help Help, help us going forward. But you know, when I take things like, let me give you an example. We talk about um, infrastructure. You know, the question you'd asked me before, we talked, we were talking about infrastructure and we said, oh, everybody keeps talking about power. And I'm happy that the minister, the honorable minister talked about power. 
you know, power is really in the hand of government. It has been partly um, privatized. And I don't want to go into too much detail about power because that's a total, like another two or three day uh, conversation. You know, like a two year I, conversation. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, but the important thing is that it is so important that government should drive this totally. Um, making sure that the privatization is complete. Everywhere else in the world, government doesn't not run electricity at all. You know, from sourcing to distribution, government doesn't do it. You know, we need to get to, to the place where we define what private sector should do and then let private sector run with it and succeed at doing it and what government should do um, separately. That's my, that's my, my view. Mm -hmm. You know, power is one. Infrastructure is government. You know, private sector does not build roads. Yeah, they, they, they get the contract to do it. But well, that has to be governed, governed and handled by government. And that's so key. You know, I'm happy Gova talked about uh, security. You know, that is, I mean, private sector isn't going to, to, to put the police and the army in place. Government has to do that. There are quite a lot of initiatives that the private sector can do. But, you know, at the end of the day, for, for us to operate properly in this country as, as businesses and for the country itself to succeed overall, there's some things that are meant for government to do. And there's some things that are meant for the private sector to do. And there are some things that you have collaboration. Technology, for example, I'll say it's collaboration. I'll actually, actually say for technology, I'll say government leads and directs, but private sector takes control, takes charge, implements, and makes it successful. You know, power is another one that I said definitely, you know, but security, absolutely not. Government should handle that because that's the only way you could, I mean, you know, from, from a legal point of view, that's the only way you can handle that. That would be my view on this. Thank you very much, Yemeka. You know, it's clear, honestly, that the way forward for Nigeria is a distinct collaboration between government and the private sector. It's clear that the private sector and government must be talking to each other all the time, and they must be listening to each other. It's also clear that government should be assuming that it knows the answers or has the answers to everything. These things are clear. And I hope we can start coming from what I call the lows of this pandemic and this having to reset and this massive disruption, we'll start learning to understand and talk to each other. And I keep going back to the example of the COVID, the partnership between the private and public sector at sub-national and national levels to face this pandemic. Health, health partnership, um, uh, resource partnership. And I'd like to come to you very quickly in Gove before we do q and I'm being told that we have many people wanting to ask questions, you know, and many questions for each of the panelists. And I think it's good we have this in the picture. But before we go there, and go there very quickly, you know, because your sector, like Yimika's sector, is critical to how we develop and how we move forward and how we progress. So what do you think the finance, financial services sector's response should be to where we are and help to get out to where we are? And again, many people feel that our financial services industry does not have the depth and the capacity to play the role it should play. Uh, Yimika talked about infrastructure and government taking the lead. But we also know that government doesn't have the money and government must create an environment to attract the money. Um, government is not the biggest spender, although the minister said so. The private sector is the biggest spender, informal and formal. So we need, first of all, to educate government that it is not the biggest spender and stop behaving as if it is. So what do you think the financial sector needs to do? And do you have the capacity to do it? We certainly have the capacity to do it. Um, that's why I'm in the, in the industry. Put it in perspective, um, outside of South Africa, Nigeria is the second sort of largest financial sector in Africa. So it's, it's big. Um, the deposits and assets, when you look at those statistics, um, we, we do have depth. I think to really analyze the sector, you know, depth is one way of looking at it. You also look at access. And then you look at what's the asset side relative to GDP. And that I think is where there's significant growth. So Nigeria is currently hovering around the 10% mark. Um, and when you look at countries like South Africa that are around the 70, 80% mark, and then across other countries where, you know, when you look at OECD and BRICS, you know, around the 30% mark is a good way. You can see that there is a lot of, there's, there's scope for growth. But as an industry, we've come a long way. So, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you had the issues of illiquidity, you had very fragmented institutions. Now they've grown. Um, looking at the size and scale, looking at the players, you've got very strong, I don't like to call them locals because they're not. Um, a lot of them are quite big regional players. Um, and even if they're only in Nigeria, they're humongous in terms of size and scale. 
And you've also got the international players. And then don't look at just banks. I mean, you look at the financial institutions, there are a number of other players that provide credit in one way or the other. To get us out of this, um, I think the banks are already doing it. And we've got a great regulator in the CBN to the extent that they've helped us to provide the latitude to do a number of things, so restructure existing facilities, um, try and provide assistance to sectors of the economy that we need growth to happen in. So encouraging us to lend into those, um, creating frameworks, um, allowances that the institutions can draw on to then deepen. Um, the, the area that I think we need to work on is access to, to capital. And that access to capital you know, spans obviously regulations around how people interact in the market, around how we attract that capital in, because people need to feel that my capital is safe. And if they're not sure, because either the fundamentals around the economy are shaky or there's huge country risk, then you won't see the inflows come in and you won't see the interaction. You know, it's really about safety. My money is safer if I put it under my bed than putting it in an institution or, or supporting an industry that I'm not sure what's going to happen tomorrow. So a lot of the, 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 the growth that our industry can um, catalyze is dependent on collaboration. And it's really around how government, private sector come together to chart a path for the country as a whole. And then focusing on the areas that we think are critical and then all coming together to make that work. Um, I don't see how we can do it um, in silos, which is to me the way that we're doing it at the moment and why we're not successful. So we all need to come together. We can't do silo growth. It doesn't happen. You know, we need to come together to determine how we are going to proceed and to actively implement how we proceed. Let me go to Q&A. We don't have very much time. I think we have less than 15 minutes. And there's so many questions out here. But uh, let, let me go to Q&A. And, um, and uh, let me apologize up front to those who have questions for the Honorable Minister. What I will do is uh, ask the organizers to please send this minute questions to the Honorable Minister and so that he can directly message you in response. I'm so sorry. And like I said, he had to run off. But I, I will start off here with question. Let me start off with you, Kingsley. There's a question here for you. Um, the current alliance between the private and public sector does not appear to be working. Are government agencies ready to disrupt and adapt to a new way of working that actively seeks out and leverages private initiatives for public benefit? Let me ask you again. The current alliance between the private and public sector does not appear to be working. Are government agencies ready to disrupt and adapt to a new way of working that actively seeks out and leverages private initiatives for public benefit? So that's for you, Kings. The over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think. Um, can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. Okay. okay. Um, I think that question is quite on point. Um, it is true that the alliance today isn't working. But I think why it is not working isn't because collaboration isn't the way to go. It is because the strategy for engagement has been faulty. Now, why is it faulty? To politics and government, just like any other aspect of our life and society, um, tries a whole lot on that incentives and disincentives. We, have, we haven't been able to craft the engagement in such a manner that shows government that it is also a winner in the process. And also that if it doesn't do what it needs to do, that there will be consequences for itself. So to a large extent, our, our policies and government have continued to run on a zero-sum pedestal, on a parallel, so to speak, where it is either my way or the highway. And so the approach of private sector hasn't been hasn't taken into cognizance what is going on and how to reshape it through carrot and stick method. I think private sector is a little bit public shy and um, and so does not confront government so much because again the government is 
given the impression that it is too big. And if you go against government, it's going to come hard at you. But this is not going against government. It is simply engaging more strategically in so, such a way that government wins and you win as a private sector. And therefore, I propose, and it's simple, that the strategy that will survive and continue to make ends is that strategy that is broad-based, the strategy that is open and data-driven. There is a whole lot of ad hoc strategy for engagement that is going on in the private sector. And I think that um, Mrs. Oyeyemika was um, responding to uh, the initial inference I made, which gave the impression that government, the private sector should go looking for governments to engage. It isn't necessarily that, and that's where that paradigm is the wrong paradigm. It is a collaboration that, just like the way we find partnership, if I want to go into business, I will look for someone who has a comparative advantage or an enabling advantage that helps me. And I engage with the person. Whether the person comes to me first or I go there first, the most important thing is that my strategy ensures that we collaborate. Therefore, the collaboration must be deliberate, it must be strategic, it must be well thought out. What is, it, what is the need for government? What is the need for the private sector? What is the ultimate purpose? Private sector, public sector engagement is that the private sector also has to face the challenge of being a short time player. As a private sector player, like Cadbury, you will, at the end of the year, give account as to how much you have earned. Highest is five years. If you don't earn anything, you might run into trouble. But government does not have that, that level of risk. And so you, as, as Cadbury, do not want to be into a long-term relationship that you don't see the end game. But it has to be done. If we want to move our vision to, to, to uh, if we want to move the private sector in Nigeria to a better place, gov government is your biggest factor. And if government does not play its role well, the Nigerian private sector will need to suffer severely, even in the midst of a major beautiful prospect as the Nigerian market can give you. Kingsley, thank you very much. And that dovetails to a question for Yimika. Um, the, if the government doesn't play its role well, then it appears we're all sunk. Now, let, let, let me ask you a question, Yimika, straight up. This is straight to you. Please, can you ask Mrs. Adeboe, do you think that the government distrusts the private sector? Do you think that government distrusts the private sector? If you think so, what do you think must now be done to rebuild trust? So we then go to what Kingsley said. How do we get government to work better with the private sector so that we can catapult Nigeria into the first world in the shortest possible time? Mrs. Adeboe, do you think the government distrusts the private sector? If it is so, why? And how, what do we need to do about it? I don't think the government distrusts the private sector. Um, in all fairness, there have been quite a lot of uh, uh, joint initiative between the private and public sector. So I don't believe the government distrusts the private sector at all. If you look, for example, at the uh, Nigerian Economic Summit Group, which you know uh, quite a lot about, you know, there, there are quite a, a number of initiatives there, um, long forward looking, and that's where the private, Kingsley said it, you know, the private sector is not into a short term relationship. It has to be long term, really, because you invest and you expect returns on your investment. The only difference is that we expect returns immediate. Uh, we don't come in, uh, the bankers know it, in Europe, you know it. We don't come in, put money in and expect to walk away. We put money in, knowing that, you know, you may even put money in and in two, three years, don't make any money but you know eventually you will make money. 
you know, at the end of the day, whatever the private sector is going to do in terms of investing, it expects some return. And I think that is really the, the focus of, of the conversation. There are a lot of initiatives in Nigeria. You know, let's take power, for example. Private se sector has invested significantly in, in um, distribution. Um, we should go upscale or down, downstream, as I say, and, and, and allow further investment. You know, I think there's a fear, actually, not a distrust uh, by government that, oh, if we let our hands off, things may go belly up and, you know, the wrong people will benefit from it. I think that's where the conversations need to happen as to it's not about trust, it's about what happens when I let go. The reason why a lot of things are still not privatized in Nigeria is simply because the government is more concerned about the implication to the larger population. There are 200 million Nigerians. You don't want, uh, or you don't, you don't feel comfortable that, oh, you know, all stakeholders will be, will be looked after and, and they'll benefit from it. And I think that's where government needs to start having confidence. You can listen to, you can listen to yourself. So you're actually confirming that government doesn't trust the private sector? No, I'm not saying trust. I think it's the, the word trust this? is what? It's not trust. It's, it's a, the, when I say the longer term view, it's not about trust. It's just about being sure that things happen the way the, go the government wants everybody to be, to be protected. You know, uh, we're a capitalist economy, whether we want to call it that or not. And if you look at every capitalist economy, you have to allow the private sector to do what it needs to do and ensure as a government, that rules are followed. That's what the role of government should be, putting policies, putting rules, so that people can do what they need to do. And if they don't do it right, sanction them, but allow them to do it. But that's not trust, uh, as we, that's not trust at all. That's just ways of working and understanding ways of working. I think trust is where you, know, you, you have to monitor everything, you have to watch people, you, have, you don't believe they can do what they say they want to do, you believe that they're just saying it to make money. You know, while, while people want to make money, while the private sector wants to make money, the private sector also wants Nigeria and the economy to run well. I mean, we're talking about a recession in quarter four. Nobody wants that. And if there are things that we could do in the private sector to avoid it, we would do, do so. Unfortunately, it's bigger than any company and any, any entity to, to, to manage the economy. It's, it's a collective work. And that is what needs to happen. There has to be collective effort by all parties with a common purpose. I think that's where you don't, where you don't feel where you don't feel as a follow up to this your question you don't feel we're over regulated and over monitored you don't feel so um when i compare us to other countries i don't think so and let me give you a classic example you know we're multinational we're, we're my, my company my holding company is quoted in the u.s we don't have antitrust rules here like the u.s does for it you know you know we we don't have monopoly rules here that that is that is out there that restricts businesses from operating in ways that we operate here. We in now have, this it's is a way, we now have. I know, yeah. I know we have, but I, I'm saying that it's not as rigid. It is not as rigid. You don't, you don't, the things that we see out there that you don't, you can't allow, you know, out in, you know, in the US or in Europe, there are some things there that, you know, we just do naturally. And it's not against the law. It's just that the way our rules have been set. So I don't feel we're over-regulated. Yes, we are regulated, but there are areas where we may be over-regulated. But generally, we're not that overregulated. Thank you very much, Madam. Ngobe, um, who do you think, you know, this question is for you, directed at you, that please ask Mrs. Umwankwo, who should lead the charge in disrupting the status quo and forging a better, more efficient alliance between the private and public sector? Should it be the private sector? Who should lead the charge in disrupting the status quo and forging a better, more efficient alliance between the private and public sector? Should it be the private sector? So I'll go out on a limb and I'll you say have that- two minutes because I have one other interesting question for um, Kingsley and then we have to wrap up. I think it should be the government. I think that there always has to be someone leading. Now, from my perspective and where I sit, I think the government has got to determine the, the path for growth. And it's a very broad path. The private sector comes in understanding what those pillars are and what the eventual plan is, and then working with the government collaborates. But there has to be from, the government I think has got to come to the table with an understanding that we're in really dire streets. And that as a country, if we really want to achieve inclusive growth, it needs to go back to the drawing board. 
I think that for me is the first step. And that first step can only be government. And I think once that realization is there and there is a humility around how we approach collaboration, then both parties will come to the, to the table. Thank you very much, Igobe. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Kingsley, very quickly. We will, we, this question, please, for Mr. Mark. We've been making decisions over the years based on political consideration, and this has always led to waste and inefficiencies and why we haven't developed as well as we should have. Mr. Mark, what's your view on this? We have been making economic decisions based on political considerations. As a consequence, we haven't developed as well as we should have, and it has led to a lot of waste and inefficiencies. What's your view on this? Very quick. I totally agree. I totally agree that our public conversations um, and engagements has been significantly, significantly impaired by politics. Politics has eaten too deep into places that should that should be apolitical, and um, where we have convergence of interests, and where the vision should be that of country, that of the economy, that of society. We have allowed too much politics to erode our conversation, but we can still find a way back to a more constructive and engaging public conversation that leads to public value. And I think that it starts with us realizing that governments will come and go. Nigeria will still remain. I was going through recently a, a, a paper that was published in 1963 about the Nigerian national, um, national plan. Development plan, uh, yeah. Yes, development plan of 1962 to 1968. You see, if you look at this document, you will see that really a whole lot has changed in the way we have conversation about development in Nigeria. And what you just said now is very significant factor that has led to the corrosion that we see. And maybe that is one of the reasons why the private sector has become public shy, because they don't want to offend any particular government or make any government think it is not in their favor. But we must back up a little and say to ourselves, where have we gone from where we stopped? If you think about development in the way that um, we should think about it, we will think about it as, you know, shoots, offshoots of, you know, plants that needs watering. We had our, we have our music industry that is thriving. We have our Nollywood, they are thriving. But we haven't looked at what, at the regulatory institutional structures that we can leverage to expand even this sector that we already have natural inclination and is doing well on. So, we have, let me cut you short, Kingsley, so, because we're running out of time. So you agree okay. that uh, economic decisions have been wrongly based and we should do a change and a makeover. And we should absolutely, it. absolutely. We have to now start thinking of how best to do that. And I hope we will have a subsequent uh, opportunity to talk about how to do this makeover. Yeah. And I'd like to thank our panelists. But before you go, um, I won't let you get off so easily. I'd like you to have 10 seconds of a last word, disrupting the status quo. We need to chart the path for a forged alliance between public, private sector, and every sector and every stakeholder. And we need to work hard at this because Nigeria needs to become a first world country with all the talent that it has. So closing statement, five seconds, you go first. It is critical 
that we disrupt the status quo because status quo is a recession and possibly a depression. And so we definitely need to come together. We need inclusive, sustainable growth and we need public and private partnerships. That's the only way that we can do this. Thank you very much, Madam. Kingsley. I think there is no alternative to finding and forging a more effective collaboration between government and the private sector. And we must begin to put our efforts, very strong effort to making it work, irrespective of what the differences are, unless we begin to create our values based on collaboration, they wouldn't last. They will fizzle away. Our short timing has not helped us. And working in parallels have, is exactly why we are where we are. So we don't have any choice but to do that. Thank you very much, Kingsley. Yimika? I think I'll twist uh, this a little bit and throw a question back at you and say um, that what can the SBL do um, to facilitate a process? Because we all agree that needs with collaboration. Somebody's got to take the first step. And typically when these things need to happen, someone it's always good for someone to um, spearhead it or at least facilitate, make, make the, the both parties come together. So what can SBL do to bring both parties together? I will put that charge back. And to the team and say, this is really what, what needs to happen, but how do we do it? We all, we, we're a nation of 200 million people, and we're very smart, we talk a lot. I, I, everywhere I go, I hear Nigeria, everyone has an opinion on what we need to do to fix Nigeria, uh, but we haven't fixed it. So to fix it, I think we need to make it happen. We, we need to do things to make this, make this happen. So how do we put the heads together to, to make these things happen? Is my, my chat back to the SBO, what can you do? Um, to, to, to facilitate, to enable this, this uh, collaboration. I, I believe that very quickly, the SBL working with the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, working with MAN, working with NECA, and working with the organized private sector, and even the informal private sector, will work harder to engage with government. I think there needs to be a bridge building so that government understands the capacities of the private sector, appreciates those capacities, and utilizes those capacities. At the same time, the private sector also needs to uh, work well. I don't want to use the word trust. I see you don't like that word. So the private sector itself needs to work well with government and encourage government to provide an enabling environment. I think it's critical. If we have the enabling environment, and we've all talked brilliantly about the kind of environment that will attract a lot more investment. And government needs to take that seriously. I know the vice president's uh, committee is working the enabling business environments. They're working hard, but they've really just only scratched the surface. The big elephants in the room haven't been dealt with, you know? The security issues, for instance, that's a big elephant in the room. Power, another big elephant in the room. You know, and there are really big elephants in the room that make you decide whether you want to bring your money here or go somewhere else. It's competition for capital. It's as simple as that. So we need to deal with, and the enabling business environment, they've done well, but there's a lot more they need to do to deal with the big elephants. And I think we all just need to come together and uh, work at this and keep talking. But I think where we've always fallen short as a, as a country is the implementation process. You know, we have great laws. We have great thoughts. Like you said, um, Yimika, you know, everywhere you go, Nigerians are top everywhere in the world. Nigerians have a view. Even on little things as mundane as football and as big as development plan, they always have a view. And they think their view is the best view. But, so we need to harness all of this so that we can move forward. At this point, I'd like to really thank the SBL for giving us this opportunity and this platform talk about this issue. Um, unfortunately, we don't have as much time as we would all love to have so that we can further do greater justice to this. Um, there are so many questions for all the panelists. Um, we haven't even started, you know. And what I'll suggest to the organizers is please, if you can, um, arrange the questions for each panelist and send it direct to them. And if the panelists, please, I know you're all extremely busy people, spend a few minutes, please respond and so that uh, we can send back the responses either directly or through the SBL to the questions. I, I thank you so much. I know we've eaten into your day and into your time, but I think it's well worth it. I think what we've been able to achieve today is good for the progress of our country. I'd like to thank the Honorable Minister in absentia for his time. Um, I know that um, we had to really claw back at him and thank him so much. I thank you, Yimika, for your time. I know you're extremely busy. You're taking care of the whole of West Africa. 
We're extremely proud of you and your achievements. Thank you so much. And thank you for finding the time to join us. I, Ngoven, I thank you so much. I know you are half on holiday and you have to come back to do this. I thank you so much. I thank you for the waves you're making in the banking sector and the contributions of your bank to the financial services industry. Thank you. And uh, my brother, Kinsley, you know, you keep going from in, out, out, in. Now that you're in FIU, we expect to see that um, we'll see a lot more transparency in the financial, in the in the in the financial services and business services, and that we'll be able to trust what comes out of uh, government. I trust you, and I know you will make a great impact. I thank the panelists. You're a great bunch. You are really a star-studded bunch, and I seriously wish we had a lot more time. I thank the SBL again. Uh, God bless everybody. Have a wonderful day. And I think we've uh, managed to set people thinking as to the direction. Thank you and have a great day.